We're here at Burning Man Renegade Burn yep. 2021, exactly 20 years after my first Burning Man in 2001. And um, there's a way in which it's come full circle. It looked like it was never going to be what it started as because it felt when I first came here. And I was already a few years in by 2001. It already was talk of, of it being have gotten too big for its own sake. But I, um, that's right. But I, you know, there was. I read an article that was one of the founders who had s dropped out of the organization. Said the problem is anarchism doesn't scale, and um, and it's not supposed to scale, right? That's why you're supposed to have, you know, federations. And uh, but the problem is an event like this, which just gets bigger and bigger, um, you start to it start stops feeling like something self-organized, right? And you start having to have hierarchy, hierarchy and, and rules and, and authority and all of this stuff. And because of COVID, uh, they, they canceled Burning Man the last two years. And uh, last year, I guess I heard like maybe 5,000 people showed up anyway and did a kind of miniature burn. And, and I wasn't there, unfortunately, because I didn't know about it or I would have been. But this year, word got around and maybe... I don't know. My guess is probably 15,000 people showed up. I think it's probably about 15, 20,000, maybe a little more. It's hard. I don't know. It's really hard to say, to say and I'm actually kind of glad there's no there's no census. So th it's for those of you who don't know, uh, this, you know, this is the playa. This is um, usually there's this like, again, top down structured um, uh, urban design that's done of the city and there's streets. And there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of organization that goes into it. And I think, you know, people pay $500 a ticket. If you multiply that times the 75,000 people who show up, I mean, it's tens of millions of dollars that come in. I heard they pay like $6 million for their permit. Yeah. And, and this year, none of that. No right. tickets, no organization, no uh, uh, porta potties, no streets. And I thought maybe it was, was going to be, you know, the, the play is the size of LA County. So I thought there was going to be, you know, just like a camp every several hundred yards and it was just going to be very weird, autonomous Mad Max. And instead, it kind of self-organized in a remarkably similar way to the way it usually feels. That's right. And this yeah. is just <laughs> astonishing to me, right? And, and, and very uplifting. Astonishing? It's, I mean, it's, I, it, for me, I guess it's just kind of an, you know, it's like a natural thing. It's like if people want to be here, then they really want to be here. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, people who really get it already. And I don't know, I mean, people don't necessarily need a, you know, a government, uh, like a government, like an exterior govern government uh, telling them how to organize. I mean, things here are more peaceful than normal. Uh, we, I, barely seen any trash i've seen none all. we've been to yeah. like i've been out every night all night long i've not seen one cigarette butt on the floor the only thing i saw in the center over there i saw a tampon <laughs> are you serious i used tampon in the dust that's oh my God. That, that's it <laughs> that's the only thing i've seen that was that was moop but other than that and i and i i, I mean i hate to say i didn't pick it up but um you didn't i did not pick it up yeah i know i feel like a bad burner but um no I so think. yeah so, so the anarchism <laughs> is interesting I, I associate you with one of my early introductions to anarchism and we'll get into that but the idea that 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 people can coalesce around principles and instead yeah. of around under authority so like I think one of the great examples is AA right um, Alcoholics Anonymous is yeah. like you know they, they meet around the world there's no central office of Al Alcoholics Anonymous there's no governing body there's just these cells that emerge based on these you know whatever it is, these 12 steps um and 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 to me it's just been amazingly affirming the idea that this self-organized in this way and and there wasn't this hierarchical structure necessary and I, I, I don't know I wonder if like you've been coming since 2002 and that's when we met you want to tell the story of how we met in 2002 here yeah it was it was an awesome story so um, at the time, I was doing this thing called the Lost Film Festival, which was this traveling activist uh, media presentation that was pre-YouTube, pre-web video, and it was basically showing the types of things that would eventually become viral web videos, um, but on VHS and DVD, uh, so very, very early on. And I saw the LAFCO bus, and L LAFCO is the LA Filmmakers Co-op, which is the thing that you started um 
back in the day and I saw I saw you guys off in the distance it must have been a mile and I was like oh filmmakers and I booked it I just started running as fast as I could to catch you guys and you guys are like rolling and rolling along and I was like running and running and running and just like, like totally out of breath and I caught up to you guys and I knocked on the door and you guys opened it up and I was I wasn't I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know whether you guys were cool or whether you guys were going to be surly. It was like the end of Burning Man. Everything was, you know, everybody was just like, you know, really like kind of in a bad mood. But um, you were on the bus. Uh, Olivia was on the bus. And Freeman was on the bus. And I, I guess a couple other people. And I was like, hey, who are you guys? And you're like, hey, uh, sorry, we're just like kind of burned out and like totally spent from this week but here's our contact just get in touch and that's when our friendship began uh so i reached out to you and um and i remember a little while after that you're like oh hey like scott i need a gra i need some graphic design done i like we need a new logo and you know and i uh, wound up putting together a logo for you guys if you remember that yeah i loved and, it and that mm -hmm. was awesome and uh yeah it was like it was like real. it was like punk rock punk rock and hip-hop at the same time and uh and then the next year we camped together uh monkey versus robot it, and that was a uh, that was fantastic um i so so when i in 2001 i ended up moving into this school bus that was the seat of this organization called los angeles filmmakers cooperative yeah. and um it was written about in the guardian as like the first anarchist movie studio on wheels digital video studio on wheels yeah and um <laughs> and the idea was to like we ripped out the seats of this old school bus that i bought on ebay for like two thousand dollars in colorado and um and we put like three editing stations which at the time had to be quite bulky we had to have a raid array which like yeah. was this giant thing full of like 20 hard drives in order to have like one terabyte and um and we would travel around and, and, and make films and introduce artists who were used to working in other media to the wonders of this new medium. Nonlinear editing. Of yeah. nonlinear editing. And, and digital video, which was, sorry for interrupting. Was, no, no, please interrupt yeah, it was, all, all the no, time. It was, it was, yeah, it was super awesome what you guys were, what you guys were doing because and the thing I was super into is that you're bringing it to, you're bringing it to poor neighborhoods like in, in LA, like Compton, where the school system is just kind of crummy that it's not it's not well funded and and or at least at the time it was it was kind of crummy and unfortunately it wasn't funded wasn't funded uh well enough and you were making this accessible to people who didn't have the resources to get cameras to get good recording gear to get um like audio recording gear to get uh, like any of this stuff and you found some like absolute gems of people yeah. to come in like who were just so appreciative and I remember I remember when you guys came on tour and you brought you know uh, you brought a few people from you know from, from the neighborhood across the country it was like the first time that they some of them had ever left even LA yeah, yeah and it was just so, I mean the, it was just so grateful like, like how excited they were to be in Philly and they're just like oh check this out like it was like it was, it was like they were giddy and I was just I was just this was like, 2006 then like yeah. five four years after we met yeah but, but so so my first experience awesome, yeah. of Burning Man was I thought we it was just a freak idea to like take digital you know technology and mix it with nomadism and mix it with yeah. creativity and mix it with education and mix it with community so, and I hadn't even coalesced around these ideas in any sort of concrete way it was just a a, a notion to do this it felt like the r right for the spirit of the time and what the time of my life that that was and then someone was told amazing. me about burning man which i'd never heard of <laughs> and i showed up here and i was like whoa twenty-five thousand like-minded individuals doing very similar things exactly. bringing together like i think emphasizing imagination over all else community again a kind of non-hierarchical feeling you know, there were tickets, but I think back then it was like $180 for the tickets. It felt very reasonable to come here and, 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 and what that $180 provided in terms of porta potties and the man, the spectacle of the man at the end, which kind of was this focal ritual, focal yeah. com coming from fire, right? Fuoco. Um, so literally focusing the community around this 
yearly ritual, which I think like creates a sense of meaning and of continuity. And so there was this great sense of like meeting other people who wanted to emphasize, uh, you know, uh, self-reliance, uh, this kind of idea of practicing for whether it's colonizing other planets or the after the apocalypse. And of course, you know, you can be cynical and say, well, of course, you're buying all this stuff at Walmart before you come here. And it's only just like this one week of Dionysian like excess yeah, when it's like held bit. up that's, by an Apollonian but, like. But that's just some people. That's not really the whole that's not at the core of it. I mean, it's really it's it's people like a lot of the people who go to Walmart beforehand and do the it's, it's like people who don't really who don't really really prepare but you know but it's but eventually over time people matriculate into this stuff and they do pre you know they do prepare and they kind of get into this you know this kind of um mindset of you know autonomy and self-reliance and it's not that's the thing about burning man is that it's not really didactic and over and overtly political even though it like at, at its core it really is because it's uh, you know it's all about freedom and and uh expression and you know and just and being open-minded and you know all these things that are kind of like in antithesis to a a lot of the types of things that we experience under market capitalism and uh you know or at least like under like american uh kind of mainstreaming market capitalism uh whatever that is um (laughs) anyway um yeah like well i I think i was gonna say that that so what happens though is i think i i was always not wanting to be cynical and wanting to give the most the brightest interpretation of this and i i drank from the source of this breaking down of barriers which i think is one of the job of progressive and radical people i think is to kind of push at boundaries and here where you literally have no boundaries and it's a place where people push at boundaries in terms of you know whether it's nudity whether it's just practices of just you know uh kind of communicating with strangers and sharing and not making it about you know there's no logos allowed there's no selling of or buying of things allowed all of these this ethos which whether it's not i totally ideal and you can pick apart at 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 it but at its source at its essence there is a kind of idealism at work which hopefully you take with you into the real world quote unquote and you have that inspiration that you got here and you maybe talk to strangers more and share your resources and not depend on on not not feel like you need that sense of authority and and of structure and of boundaries and of walls and of all of the things that we associate with regular life in you know this capitalist society yeah um but as it grew it became harder and harder to have this rose-colored view of it because as as, you know as we've mentioned like the tickets got more expensive it got you got these fancier and fancier camps people spending millions of dollars like and you know the, the the the, the, the disparity between the rich and the poor that could afford to come here and you get all these tech people who like, you know, the founders of these, what, what at the, you know, started out as these kind of really cool, you know, the, the internet itself was this kind of anarchist utopian place in the nineties. They would talk about the net and you'd hear about Terrence McKenna talking about how it's like a psychedelic enterprise to break down boundaries and democratize yeah. everything. And then, you know, to much of our sadness it, it, it coalesced around these like enormous wealth and power around these few people and they ended up coming to burning man so you'd see like oh that's the founder of youtube and that's the ceo of, of google and they yeah. come in in their private jets and they have their camps that are have you know private chefs and you're not allowed into that camp because it's walled off and it's just like it, it got really hard to see this as more than a really hedonistic party and this year to me has brought back some of the idealism and i, mean, I wonder if you me, could reflect on that yeah for me it's uh this is really brought back a lot of the type types of like the feeling from a lot of the types of things that I was going to even before I was going to Burning Man like actually by the time I went to Burning Man I'd already felt like oh it's like too commercial because I was like involved in all these like festivals that were going out and going on in the woods and I was organizing my own things and I was just kind of I kind of felt like oh this is like really expensive ticket to like basically it's like almost a $200 ticket to hang out hang out in the desert it's like what are you really getting for it and that was like kind of my mentality at the time around it and 
Um, and I guess like my my general attitude about it over time, you know, because I, I guess I just was kind of like elitist uh, like at the time because I was like just kind of very very deeply involved in the subcultural stuff and and activism and I you know I, I don't know like I just I was kind of I kind of had a little bit of a jerk elitism thing going on but over time I wound up I over time I wound up seeing that um the that this was this was like people's first experience with punk rock like that they're like that they're in their like 20s or 30s and that they were finally able to like let go of all these expectations like let like that their parents you know might have had on them and their families and and work and you know and like it was kind of awesome actually like meeting people here who were in like lousy relationships that they didn't like and they were like like yeah I got it here in my like expensive car like I remember this conversation I had with this one person who like had just come out here um, in his like expensive car and whatever and his wife and and he took and he wound up just like taking a bunch of like whatever he was taking I, I can't remember and we were sitting down and talking he's like yeah he's like I he's like yeah I just can't I can't stand the marriage I'm in and and like you know I just don't know what to do and I was like you have kids and he's like no just he's like and I can't stand my job I'm like what's keeping your job what's keeping your marriage and he's like I don't know and like <laughs> like a month later he like <laughs> he like gets in touch with me he's like yeah I, I'm getting a divorce and I quit my job and I'm like that's kind of awesome like that you know that he came out here and just like kind of like you know that he he had like a break from that kind of thing and was able to see other things because he w he was so cynical he was a, a, like super cynical person um and just kind of like laughing like laughing at all the stuff going on and totally he like had this really heart opening um experience and that's i guess that, that's one of the things that happens out here one there's a lot of uh opportunity to kind of like really transform and see things in a very positive way and um and so i you know i wound up feeling that this was like this was actually like a really good thing for people to see possibilities of other things that they could they could be involved in and and the other thing too that i thought was really fantastic about this is that like in like in a lot of these subcultural contexts that that i'm in you know like people are able to people are able to play shows and do whatever and like in small diy venues and it's kind of where people get a chance to kind of like you know play their instrument or do poetry or whatever and unless you're really in those diy communities or know about these like kind of underground things you like don't really get you don't really get exposed like to this stuff like very easily and so um like having stuff like center camp or pe people being able to just perform and like get get out there like get in front of people and kind of break down the barriers of their of their shyness like that's one of the things that spaces like this make for other people it's it's basically a safe space for expression and i guess it's it's like one of the things that i like really really totally love about this yeah i was just listening to a podcast this morning with rick doblin who's the founder of maps uh the the psychedelic study uh, the multiplayer multidisciplinary yeah. multidisciplinary association for, for psychedelic, psychedelic studies, studies. And the podcaster asked him, like, what does psychedelic mean? And he said he reminded him of the story of Humphrey Osmond and and uh, Aldous Huxley came up with this term together, psychedelic, which means mind manifesting. And yeah. and most people associate that just with drugs. And that's true. That's usually that's what we mean when we say psychedelics. But he said, you know, dreams are psychedelic because they also like reveal yeah. what's going on in the mind you know, without the external world or our everyday, you know, understanding of what it is to be human. And, uh, you know, it occurs to me now that at its best, Burning Man is psychedelic in that way, too, because we, we leave our ordinary concerns for a week. You know, the cell phone doesn't work. The um, again, there's this yeah. emphasis on on this basic survival, this basic sense of community, this uh, uh, this huge emphasis on imagination and when what can come from like 
emphasizing imagination. What what's most astonishing is like the the effort that people put into making the art here and into making this work as as this kind of group of people. And and um, so I think that that's that makes it psychedelic. It makes it reveal something about the nature of the human mind and imagination that yeah. again hopefully you you take with you and apply and again this is a very important thing about the psychedelic experience is that you you reintegrate the lessons of it right so some people they just see it as a fun thing and then they don't learn anything from it and that's a shame like the best thing is if you can integrate and so i yeah. think the best thing is that you can do is when you leave this is the last day of, of burning man yeah <laughs> we've been here for like five days we're all a bit wrecked it's uh, not it's not burning man this is yeah. renegade burning man burning man was canceled yeah exactly yeah we're, we're canceled this year <laughs> <laughs> it's okay but so so scott um was uh really influential in my thinking about things because he also had this this what, i don't know what you would call the lost film festival is it was it an organization and a a a, uh, it was a thing. A thing. <laughs> it was a thing. It was. So. <laughs> it, w it was. Um, it was a culture jamming project that was designed. It, w it was designed to basically use um, things that people normally thought of as like kind of like in this like weird hierarchy, like that film was somehow important or it made people really important, and that the things that people were talking about in film in the film world were important. And I thought like, oh, okay, well, a lot of the ideas that are kind of coming from these like activist communities and things that I'm into, like this is pretty important um, but I but you know being an activist for a long time and being involved in direct action politics and <clears throat> and and all this other stuff it kind of became very frustrating that things weren't really changing and I wanted to kind of actually like have some type of like positive type of change where people were introduced to new types of ideas and new ways of expressing things that that's really what what was at the core of the Lost Film Fest. And now, now was practically speaking, though, let's yeah. just uh, describe what you were doing, because you were going around with a backpack, a projector, and a DVD player, and a VHS deck. Was and two, you two suitcases that weighed under 50 pounds. One had, one was full of, one was full of, um, of video cassettes, DVDs, and merch, and the other one was full of um, video projector, and, and, uh, a laptop. and D DVD, DVD, and, and, uh, and VHS decks and, th and stuff like that, and uh, and he would show these films. Yeah. I, 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 what, what struck me most is that because I started attending some of these screenings. Some of them I was involved in helping to, right. to host at, at our space in Venice Beach, where we had the the, the kind of, um, the, once we had a, a building for LAFCO, what we were based just out of the bus for the first year, and then we met Freeman, and and yeah. and thanks to Freeman, we got this building, and. Um, and so we would host these screenings that Scott would bring these really cool, obscure, short films that people were making. And again, there was no YouTube or anything like that. So it wasn't like this access that we now just take for granted to short film content. It was really hard because if, without television or, uh, you know, uh, or uh, film festivals, not many people had a, a way to see these films. And so Scott right. would go around and he would show these films. And sometimes we, I think we went down to, to Compton to my friend's there and showed yep, the films down right. at, at, at this great little coffee shop where we would do things and then at LAFCO in Venice and and what struck me most is that Scott would have the same passion and enthusiasm for screening the films if it was 50 people in the audience or if it was five people in the audience well why not of course I mean well, like, yeah it's because it's not about it's not about the numbers it's about it's about the, the connection it's about the ideas and like and sometimes it's better if it's an if it's an in, uh, like an intimate audience like like I actually really and I later on I went up really missing the days of, of um, like small audiences because like over time everything grew but it was like you know it was like uh, it's it's just like where you're able to like really connect with people and then after the screening you go and hang out with them and go like find a swimming pool and or go dumpster diving and whatever and like you present these ideas so, so it wasn't really like a film festival because like and people would think about film festivals it's like oh it's you know it's this whole thing where you have a um like with a film festival it's like you have this room where you're all sitting in these seats facing one direction and there's you know you're kind of like directed into like into this like one uh thing whereas like what lost film fest 
did and was designed to do, or the touring version of it, was to kind of break down a lot of those barriers. So what I would do is I'd set up a video projector, a laptop DVD player, and and whatever whatever in the middle of the room. And so I would kind of go back and forth between people so that like we could all kind of interact. That everyone have to move their chairs, and then like you know, and it, like call, like I'd call out in the audience, and like I'd never use a microphone. And that's why it was like great also when I was doing the smaller screening because it was actually way harder to not use a mic. <laughs> like in and you traveled rooms. around the world, right? Doing like 200 screenings a year on average? And More like uh, it was 252 in 2003 and then it was like 178 in 2003. And what know, were some like of the more unusual um, screening venues? Oh, uh, so I projected um, onto the front of Skull and Bones Clubhouse uh, during the, I guess th this is like during the lead up to the Iraq War. This is um, Yale, so where George W. Yeah. Bush went to, and college. and John Kerry. So it was like John Kerry and George W. Bush both were part of this uh, secret society. And so I like went up to the front of the building and plugged into the front of the building, set up, uh, set up a table and projected onto the front. And I thought it was, I thought it was pretty um, funny. Did uh, you get away with it? Yeah. Yeah, it was no, it was no big deal. And actually, uh, years later, years later, one of the, like, actually, somebody who was part of Skull and Bones, invited me to come do a screening at Yale. I didn't realize she was part of Skull and Bones until late. I don't know. That's a whole other story. But um, uh, but it it wasn't as scary and sinister. It wound up not being as scary and sinister as as um. As I thought, but at the time it was pretty scary just because like of all, all the paranoia that was going on around the the Iraq War and like and Bush and we wasn't everyone was really afraid. Um, uh, let's see some of the other screenings uh, in the barrios of Venezuela um, during the World Social Forum in two thousand six. Uh, let's see um, many many rooftop venues, many backyards, uh, lots of protests like the FTAA. Um, protests in 2003 in Miami, which is crazy, and there were um, there were actually like several different screenings that happened during protests where like pepper spray and tear gas and all that other stuff wafted into where we were all watching the films, and uh, and I had uh, I had um, I had Seth Bachman do a um, a graphic for for Lost Film Fest, and it was like come out of the tear gas and see some flicks it was like on the marquee and on one side you had like the police who were like kind of beating up protesters and that was actually a reference to the um to, there was to the pro the screenings that we did during the republican uh convention protests in philly in 2000 when 420 activists were arrested for protesting police brutality and <laughs> you know which was really funny um i mean it wasn't funny but it was funny <laughs> um but uh yeah but i'm it, laughing but i'm not laughing well no it was it was what was really funny about this um so during this during the protests um the police were chasing tons of people and shooting you know shooting rubber bullets and tear gas at them and uh and beating people with clubs and so um, the venue where we had the Lost Film Fest on Delancey Street in Philly uh, was like one of the side streets, and people were like running, running down, and like, and we were all like waving people to come into the. Um, we were all waving, pe waving people to come into the, um, into the, uh, uh, like into the theater. So we were like hiding protesters. In the theater, while the police were like running past, it was like a total Keystone Cops uh, moment, and uh, yeah, I don't know, it was like really great. Um, and actually, Lost Film Fest is one of the things that our, you know, one of our main projects came out of, which is uh, the Evil Twin Booking Agency. So that was all that was started as a culture jamming project where we're basically trying to like one up the stuff that we're doing with Lost Film Fest, um, basically by um, bringing a lot of the people who were featured in the documentary films or making the documentary films um, to kind of like bring them into a more mainstream context. And this was at a time when uh, documentary film was actually kind of a very, very obscure thing. Um, 
like in, even film festivals didn't really have do, like docs or especially political docs available um, and uh, and actually the indie film scene at that time was was incredibly cynical and kind of apolitical um, in fact decidedly apolitical and interesting and so a lot of our goal was to basically m make it seem to the film people at Sundance and South by Southwest that actually like political activism was cool because everyone was really looking down on it at the time um, so it wasn't just you know it was like are the brights on it looks like they went dimmer really it looks less bright than before Sorry, we're just having a little... Yeah. We're trying to illuminate <laughs> our scene. For those of you who are listening and not watching for on the it's YouTube the, channel... The magic lantern. We're, 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 we're seated in front of the, the playa at Burning Man, and we're trying to light ourselves... That's better! There with the headlights of uh, Scott and Liz's car. No, that went off! There! Yes. Oh, the flasher's so, on, too. Awesome. That's okay. No, that's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about... Uh, speaking of... I'm, I'm glad you, you segued into this, because... This will make a natural uh, segue into the what I want to talk about a little bit is yeah. your broader political philosophy, because I, you know, it seems like you're one of the people who takes kind of anarchist principles and puts them to work in these really interesting specific projects, and I'm wondering if you could describe your political philosophy. You know, how does the kind of punk rock aesthetic, the nomadic lifestyle, the filmmaking, the, the festival, Burning Man. Is there some overarching kind of political, you know, philosophy or ideal that kind of acts as the backbone of your, the way you guide your life, let's say? I, I would probably say that I might call myself a malarchist. Um, I believe in a lot of malarkey. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That yeah, that's fine. Re really bad joke. <laughs> you like that? It's a really bad joke. Um, no, uh, I would say I have I have a lot of different um, political tendencies um, that are. So I, I kind of look at look at different political philosophies as as tools rather than as like dogma, like overarching um, holistic w viewpoints. Because you know, I, so I borrow from a lot of different philosophies. Um, I really like a lot of the stuff the Situationists are doing tactically, um, like back in the 60s, or doing in terms of like getting ideas into, um, you know, into the, the, I guess, into the zeitgeist, right? Um, I think, I, like, I probably, like, leaned, like, definitely leaned toward a lot of, uh, like, anarchist uh, I, I, ideals. Um, I would also say that... I'm How would you describe those ideals, briefly? Well, I would say I'm, I'm. I really. I, I guess I'm a syndicalist, like anar like in a lot of ways, like an anarcho syndicalist, and like a bit of a, kind of like a, eco tech green a anarchist as well. Like in some way, in some ways, um, I believe in in these in like these uh, mutual aid in creating mutual aid associations without like gov governance and, um, and I'm also. You know, I also find it very important to uh, respect the environment um, in the things like and to basically consider the environmental impact of the stuff that that I do like, um, but also the social, the psychological and the political impact as well. Um, and that's that's actually uh, part of what's like really been behind designing the technologies like all the all the projects that I've been doing over the past 10 years or so have kind of like come from a lot of these ideals uh, also I guess um, uh, like lately I've become I guess a bit of a Taoist so to say um, and not in the Buddhist sense but uh, DAO it's in uh, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations so in the decentralized uh, tech scene there are a lot of the, these ideal ideas about creating automated um, automated organizations basically like taking out all the people from people from an organization like let's say let's say um, rather than having a whole um, board at a company or or at a um, 
and a nonprofit, you wind up automating that entire process um, or making it easier such that you can have consensus decision making through the people. You can actually have scalable consensus decision making. So that's one of the things I've been really following a lot and like a lot of the, the innovation that's been coming out of the DAO space. That's probably the most interesting thing that's going on right now in um, in progressive politics, like period. Um, but I want to before yeah. I, uh, before I forget, well, there's so many things I want to talk about. But uh, as a parenthesis, since you brought up environmentalism, we were talking earlier before we started recording about the fact that the Salton Sea, which I'm very, you know, intimately involved with through the Bombay Beach Biennale and all yeah. of our, our work down there. Um, you know, there's all this lithium mining about to happen in the Salton Sea, and there's been this knee-jerk reaction against yeah. it because just the idea of like companies coming in and, and mining sounds like it's terrible for the environment, and you were the first person to tell me, no, oh, wait a second, <laughs> it yeah. might be okay. <laughs> no, it's um, not only okay. Well, this is not, it's not coal mining. It's not mining for gold or coal tan. It's, it's not, uh, or at least in, in this context, it's, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't have all the, the associated things with it, you know, like, like child labor and torture and, you know, that unfortunately happen, you know, in, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, uh, but, um, so it's not the mining itself that's really bad usually, uh, in, or, well, I got in. I'm stumbling on my words, but basically the, the, the political impact of the corporations being involved or in the social impact of these corporations and like how uh, generally because there's so much money at stake, um, people's rights are steamrolled, especially in places like, uh, like Bolivia, like in the Atacama Desert where um, there's, where there's lithium mining uh, happening. But the thing thing about this is that the environmental impact of lithium mining is kind of it, it's uh not really as bad it's not as bad as something like a, you know like mountaintop removal like that happens with coal or gold mine like um basically the way that lithium is is mined is that you have um these lakes these like pools and and uh the um salts the lithium salts are extracted from these you know from from the water uh and uh a lot of the time it's boiled off but you can boil off the you know you can boil off the water with you know solar power you can do it in any number of ways but basically you get the salts in order to extract the metals from the salts and so my view on um what's happening at the salton sea is actually like i i think it's a, a environmentally pretty positive thing and it will result in a lot of the cleanup of that area because the, the problem with the Salton Sea is that you just have, you know, you have a hundred plus years of agricultural runoff that's just made the Salton Sea just so incredibly corrosive. It's just, it's kind of crazy. But there's, you know, there is also, you know, there are also lithium salts. So if um, people are coming in and starting to remove lithium, the, theoretically, they'll also be removing a lot of the other uh, a lot of the other toxins and if they're if they're if they ha if they're basically going through the chemical process of breaking down a lot of the stuff that's in there that means that they'll probably have some type of model for also um extracting and uh, uh and isolating the other the other components that are inside of the that are inside of the salt and sea so it's almost like a, a kind of like an experiment in cleaning up this huge toxic mess so i guess i um I feel that a lot of the, I don't know, like uh, th there's like there's been this whole kind of like meme of criticism um, against lithium mining from the activist community, which I think is a result of um, of a lot of astroturfing, like a lot of kind of mis mischaracterization of how things how things work. Because like I don't know, it's like weird. It's like I'll see all this stuff on the like on the internet, but people really don't even understand. Uh, they're like, oh. Like, people will mistakenly say things like, oh, there are children who are mining lithium in, like, in the, these mi underground mines. And it's like, th that's ridiculous because that's not, that's not how it's mined at all. It's basically, like you said, you know, it's like basically you take the salt out of water that's, that's um, you know, like, it, like the salts are in a solution in water. So you can get lithium from seawater or from 
uh, you know, from lakes, from from any number of things. I mean, lith- any number of things. Lithium is is kind of ev- everywhere. It's just um, now the thing is that doesn't that doesn't make the um, it doesn't make the um, the environmental. It, sorry, it doesn't make the political impact any less, or the corporate like like the, you know the uh, the corporate influence impact any less. Um, so I think it's really important for activists to kind of like parse or for anyone to really kind of parse their understanding of these things and to kind of dig deeper. So unfortunately we're, we're in this time right now where it's really, um, it's inconsistent in terms of like how to get really good information. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, people who are really well-meaning wind up being turned against the things that they actually would be somewhat in support of, um, where they're convinced to turn against these things by being given uh, bits and pieces of misinformation that eventually become word of mouth memes. I mean, the same thing happened with you know proof of work mining, with um, you know with crypto. And basically, like in you know, like right now it's 2021, and uh, according to a lot of people that I know in that industry, about 80% of all crypto mining happen, where all proof of work mining happens uh, as a result of like energy that comes from renewables. Not because people in that industry really care about the environment, uh, it's because it's actually cheaper to do. Like where a lot of the, the um, you know, where, where basically they'll create solar farms and, and wind farms and they'll use uh, hydropower um, in order to power these data centers, these mi- mining centers, because um, like anybody who's actually who has any common sense will look and they'll say like, okay, like, are we going to build this system based upon? Um, are we going to build the system based upon fossil fuels and coal and <laughs> like and all this all these this non-renewable stuff? Because in the end, that stuff is going to become incredibly expensive. Right. Like, we have a giant art car driving by. Again, if you're listening, just on audio. Giant sound sound truck. That looks, that looks incredible. Cool. Sound That's really nice sound. Um, of course, the yeah. emphasis this year at Burning Man, because there were no like large scale, you know, physical uh, sculptures allowed. It's been a lot about the music. I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been, been super cool. cool. Like seriously, this is my favorite. This is my favorite time out on the out on the playa I, th- I, I think it might be mine too yeah because it's, it's been so chill it's just i've just been hanging out and meeting awesome people having great conversations it's been the best of burning man and none of the worst of it yeah and then like and then i was Instagram worried about influencers none of the yeah none of the pr- none of the tourism. no cell reception which like yeah. in years past they somehow got cell reception out here which I, was the thing that ruined it the most for me because that was yeah. as a phone addict it was like the best thing to like disconnect for those days yeah. i've been forced to disconnect again this time and then what i was thinking is that, that we're going to miss like the, the awe-inspiring stuff like the man burning which is this great like i said ritual of like around and yesterday they made the fucking man out of drones and i got chills just thinking about it right now like yeah. it was just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen a drone show. I guess people have been doing these lately. And so for some people I'd seen them before, but they made the, they used 200 drones and, and made a man that must've been 200 feet tall. Yeah. And, and then it, it rotated on its axis like this. And then it just like, it turned to, to, to bread and fell down. And it was just like one of the most truly awe-inspiring things I've seen in a long time. Like I almost cried from how beautiful it was like, yeah. And, um, and so, and then, and then again, like all of the friends I've seen here and like the, just walking around. And Do you know what I really love about this? I love me. that. I love that people who are out here actually like have to, like they really have to mean it because it's, there are no porta potties. There are no porta potties. So people have to figure out how to actually dispose of their, dispose of their waste. And that's like, that's one of the cool, one of the really cool things. It's like. They're doing sorry. a temple burn. Where, uh, Temple Burns? Sorry, yeah. Temple Burns? Where? where? Right there. We're being oh, told wait, there's going to be a oh, Temple Oh, you're going to burn? burn the, they're burning the temple over there? A model of it, I a think. A model of the temple. Okay, so we're going to... Okay, gonna, cool. Thank you. Let's take let's Thanks. take the last few minutes to yeah. tell us a bit about what you've been oh, up yeah. to since I last saw you, especially your, your new passion for 3D printing. And then maybe you'll give us a little demonstration of it. 
and then uh, and yeah. then we'll reconvene and continue this conversation so, in the so future podcast. Yeah. So okay. So what I've been working on for the past several years. Um, so I started this stage show. It's kind of like the the thing that grew out of Lost Film Fest. It was called Groucho, where it is called Groucho Fractal, and it's a bicycle powered stage show where audience members use brain computer interface to make 3D printed organic vegan snacks on a bicycle powered 3D food printer. Amazing. And so when I started the show back in 2009 or so, uh, or the idea, the genesis of the show, I didn't have a 3D printer. I didn't have brain computer interface devices. I didn't have any of this other stuff. I just had this idea. And I decided to go out of my way to like really learn. And so I threw my entire life into um, figuring out how to create technologies that intersect the that intersect um, a respect for the environment and um, and also like you know have good politics and respect people's uh, freedom and yeah so that was the whole thing and it was so it was basically like a kind of like a comedy uh, like a comedy cooking show like science demonstration engineering weird thing um, and uh, yeah and so I just of like mashed together a lot of the stuff I was interested in and what came out of that project was um, this thing called Mandelbot um, so Mandelbot is the concept of a scalable um, just creating scalable universal robotic frame assemblies and that is uh, machines that can be scaled uh, where there are nodes that can be printed out of uh, compostable bioplastics uh, w that are open source um, and available. Uh, also, there are a bunch of other parameters as well, like that the parts are symmetrical, um, that uh, they're, that uh, you make stuff using either recycled and upcycled um, parts, or like you know bioplastic. Bio There's this kind of emphasis on uh, on actually like doing the intellectual heavy lifting and kind of like figure out like how do we uh, create actual like ecotech and not just ecotech as a product that somebody can just like go to the store and buy but how do we get people away from this whole thing of this consumerism of buying a finished product and then it's obsolete and then people throw it away how do we get people back into thinking about repairing things and actually making things and getting over a lot of their anxiety over mathematics and engineering like where you know people feel intimidated by stuff like the by stuff like this even though we have these technologies in our everyday lives and um, you know like one of the things that's a huge problem uh, for the environment is this whole um, globalized manufacturing um, extraction distribution uh, system where you'll have a part a, a part that's made from something that's mined in one part of the world it's manufactured over here then it's shipped over here and then all the parts are assembled and then sent to a store in a package and people buy the thing they use it like a couple times and then they throw it in the trash and that that kind of toxic consumerism is something that like really kind of you know really uh kind of it needs to be solved like it's a problem and so um so this this um thing over here the mandelbot basically is a uh, that's uh, an attempt at an answer to that. So this particular model is something that I put together with Lucian Chapar over the past few years, who's um, an amazing wizard also. And uh, I guess we were both kind of working on the engineering and the design of this thing. And, and, uh, and uh, basically, if you look at the nodes on the ends, you can see that um, you can actually stretch this thing out in... Uh, like an X or Y or Z, and you can make make your own uh, Mandelbot with the. Uh, you can basically like go to the app that we're working working on, where you you make your own uh, blueprints uh, for this, you know, for the, for one of your choice, right? Then you can you'll be able to generate it as a um, as a set of plans. Right, uh, the cut files, the build files, the programming for the microcontroller, the build, the the build materials, like all this stuff, and on top of that, the ownership, um, which will be stored um, off chain, and the governance for it. Um, so basically, it's like uh, the whole thing will be described as a, a as a smart contract, basically, like and be s stored that way. Um, it, to be technical, it'll be an, 11, an ERC 1155 
were compatible to that uh, smart contract. And um, we're pretty close to actually like having this thing ready to you know, ready to launch. Um, smart contract being like a, it's on the blockchain, basically. Yeah, well, parts of it are on the blockchain, and then parts of it are off chain. But um, but the the NFT of it winds up pointing uh, pointing to the stuff that's stored off chain that can change over time. So, like for example, the ownership of the thing or the governance. Um, but that the that you wind up having this unique serial number for the um, for the set of for the set of assets in the first place, and that's uh, yeah. So um, uh, one of the ideas is to basically relocalize manufacture by giving people the plans to um, precision instruments such that they can build them themselves in different places, and they can start businesses where they can where they can uh, build this stuff. So you know, I was very in influenced by uh, a project called RepRap, which is a kind of self-replicating 3D printer. Um, very influenced by a project called Open Source Ecology, and the frame the frame assembly for the for the printer. Um, yeah. What's that? Oh, okay, okay. okay. So the frame so the frame assembly for it, um, like the configuration was influenced by um, by Prusa, which is uh, kind of a, an awesome uh, 3D printer project. But th there are a lot of other influences that are, that are within it. But what makes it really different uh, is the is the scalability and the fact that it can be described as a smart contract and that there's a very deliberate attempt to have a less environmentally impactful machine. Do you so think do you think if yeah. instead of if, if, since it's it is getting dark and bad oh, and also, about to also, run out too. Also you have also there are multiple print heads that are available. This one on there right now is a a, um, that's called the goo extruder, which extrudes goo, which is a uh, organic almond paste. And I'm going to do a demo where I'm going to print onto a cookie. If we run out of battery, which I think might happen on this as well, um, do you think uh, you could just give a website or a way for people to contact you, and and yeah. then we could send the, or we could post a link to where we could show a properly filmed demonstration of this? Mandelbot.io, M-A-N-D-E-L-B-O-T.io. And also uh, for people who are listening yeah. only, because this yeah. is a lot of people. Well, most let's people do don't the, see the let's video. do the demo. Okay, so so again, if you're just listening to this, yeah. this is going to stop being interesting right now. So the podcast is over. It's not going to stop being. It's kind of like because you, there's no audio. Okay, either. well, well, you could you could describe you could I describe, could describe what's happening. It's, I mean, remember that like ventriloquist ventriloquists were popular on the radio in the 30s. <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> I don't know. I just made Amazing. it up. No. Um, <laughs> okay. So go and do the print okay, as fast on. as you can because okay. our audio is also about the uh, end battery. Okay. So Scott is getting up right now. Right. It's getting dark. He's turning on his laptop and he's about to start his goo printer um, to make food. But my question is, see, I have so many questions that you're not going to be able to answer me. No, 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 go. Oh, yeah, you could bring that with you. Yeah. Hello. What are the questions? So I'll aren't you just them. taking food and just t making it a different shape? That's right. So what's, so, so what, what how do you does that solve any like problems? <laughs> 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 not to challenge you. <laughs> how does it solve a problem? Well, have you ever eaten a 3D printed cookie? <laughs> no. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> and if you haven't, then you need to experience it. Um, <laughs> you have discovered my devious plan. <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. Here. So uh, what I just did right now was I, um, I homed the printer, meaning that I brought it back to, uh, back to base. The, um, the, yeah. And so now I'm about to print via USB. We're going to do a test print of this um, of the goose treater where I'm going to be printing onto a vegan chocolate cookie now the moment of truth or something like that let's see if it works okay it's moving Uh-oh. Now what just happened? That was that was definitely a mistake. Okay, let's see what we did wrong. Okay, I'm going to rehome. Again, if you want to see this properly, not on the playa after five days of dust and no sleep, you're going to go to Mandelbot. What is it? M-A-N-D-E-L-B-O-T? Dot I-O. Dot I-O. 
and you can see all the various uses of this new technology that Scott is involved in. And okay. he's going to try this again. Oh, I see what it's doing. Uh. Yeah, one of the things that happens out here on the playa is that um, things break and they have a hard time working. Yeah, it is, you know, if you haven't been to Burning Man, it, 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 you, I think one of the things that the photos and the videos don't communicate is the vastness and the remoteness and just how alien this landscape feels. It feels like 30,000, you know, artists have colonized the moon or some other unknown planet. And um, there's very little that marks it as Earth. And now this year, there's also been huge fires that have like made it particularly otherworldly because the, the sky is full of smoke and the, the sun is red. The sunrise this morning was like printing. something I've never seen before. Okay, he's successfully printing a vegan cookie. And I'm, okay. I'm going to stop. Well, we did a test print. Kind of crummy, but it did a test print. I just okay. did a test print. This, yeah. My audio is about to run out of batteries as well, okay. so I'm going to stop this. Thank you so much, Scott, and we will continue this in another conversation soon, yes. I promise. Look, it's a bunch of goo on the goo shooter at, the, I guess it looks more like poo from a poo shooter. <laughs> or something like that. Anyway, yes, thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk again If you want to check soon. out the project and plug into it, it's um, mandelbot.io. I'm Scott Bybin, and... Uh, yeah, get so in nice touch to if you're interested you. in participating in the project. And in the future, we're going to have 3D printed eco construction uh, using not this printer, but another printer called the Mandelbot Hab uh, that we're currently working on. So, next chat out. will be in Bombay Beach. Yes. Bye, Scott. Thanks so much. Bye.